Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Coffee Chat with Matt. I have no coffee in my hands. I don't know what I did with my coffee cup. So we're uh, out here in the fruit trees and uh, Father's Day weekend here in uh, Northern Illinois. And uh, I thought fruit trees and small fruit would be a great topic to discuss. Uh, one, because I think they make a, a wonderful Father's Day gift, uh, maybe a little mini orchard or maybe something like that. Uh, but also, it, it's just something that I get a lot of questions about. And I think there's just a, a little bit of mystery around uh, growing fruit, uh, fruit trees, etc. So I thought we would uh, discuss their care and just some kind of tips and tricks that I've picked up uh, in my 30 plus years of uh, garden center uh, work. So I'm standing here next to a pear tree, but uh, in Northern Illinois, we can grow pears, peaches, plums. We can grow sweet cherries, sour cherries, uh, apples. And then the, in the small fruit area, we've got um, raspberries, blueberries, grapes, currant, josta berries, uh, strawberries, and uh, a bunch of other things too. So we'll discuss some of their care a little bit. Uh, before we get too far into the fruit trees here, I wanted to mention a couple of terms that uh, sometimes people have trouble with. So there's something called self-fertile. The, uh, the term is interchangeable, self-fertile, self-fruitful, and self-pollinating. Those three terms are all the same thing. And what that means is a tree has the ability to pollinate itself. So that means that the tree has both male and female flower parts on the same tree and that it can pollinate itself. Whereas trees that are not self-fruitful are going to require cross-pollination. So the best example of that are going to be apple trees. Pretty much all apples, there are a couple uh, very odd varieties that are self-fruitful, but otherwise all apple trees are not self-fruitful, which means they will require cross-pollination. When we talk about cross-pollination, that means that you're going to need pollen from two different trees. So it's not just a male-female kind of thing. In the case of apples, you're going to need the pollen from two different varieties of apples. So you're going to need a Fuji and a Honeycrisp or a Granny Smith and a Jonathan. They can't be two of the same. You can't plant two Honeycrisp. They will not pollinate each other because they're genetic clones of one another. So that's in, in the fruit tree world, all of these trees are pretty much grafted, which means we take the rootstock of one tree and we attach a branch, uh, say of a Honeycrisp apple to the rootstock of this other uh, wild apple or uh, semi-dwarf rootstock apple. And now my tree is a Honeycrisp. And in, uh, so in the grafting world, all of those trees are gonna be genetic clones of one another. Every Honeycrisp originated from the same tree. If you plant the seeds from a Honeycrisp apple, you will not get a Honeycrisp apple. You're going to get an apple of some kind, but it's going to be a, a genetic variety that's going to be the genetics from Honeycrisp and whatever other pollen, maybe it was a Fuji, maybe it was a Gala, whatever tree cross-pollinated with it, you're gonna get it, the genetics from both of those trees in that seedling that comes up from your Honeycrisp apple. So if a tree says that it's self-fruitful, that means you can just plant one. So self-fruitful trees, pretty much all peaches, all peaches are self-fruitful, so you can just plant one. Sour cherry, so Montmorency and North Star, those are two of the better sour cherries, baking cherries for our area. Those are self-fruitful. You don't need a second one. Or you can have two North Star. That's fine. Or two Montmorency. That's fine. Sweet cherries are going to require cross-pollination. So you're going to need two different varieties like Bing and Van or Bing and Stella. So you're going to have to have cross-pollination on those. Plums are going to require cross-pollination. Uh, Superior, Toka, Mount Royal, Santa Rosa. You're gonna to have to have at least two varieties of those. There is, uh, There are wild plums in our area, native wild plum. You might get enough cross-pollination there if you had one of those nearby, but uh, it's better to have two, uh, you know, two actual fruiting varieties. And the other thing to keep in mind, especially with things like apples and some other trees, uh, being that we're in a Northern climate, you're gonna to wanna to look for trees that will bloom at the same time. This is a little less of an issue for us here in a northern climate than it is maybe for some of our uh, you know, listeners down in a, in a southern area where they have a much longer growing season. So what happens in the longer growing seasons is you have early, mid, and late blooming apples. And if, an early, if you have an early blooming apple 
and a late blooming apple and they don't uh, flower at the same time, they're not going to cross pollinate with one another. So you have to have two earlies or two mids or two lates. Here in the northern area where our winters are longer and our season is shorter, there's much more overlap between early, mid and late, but it's still a really good idea to have two earlies or, or an early and a mid and a mid and a late, that type of thing, because you've got a better chance of having them overlap their bloom time so that they're able to cross pollinate. Um, in terms of uh, other issues that we see on fruit trees, fruit trees are something that are going to require spraying no matter what in our area. We have a lot of fungal issues that uh, fruit trees can get. There's of course a lot of insect issues that uh, fruit trees can get. So we have an organic fruit and orchard spray. It's made by Bonide. Um, and that's what we would recommend spraying. There are label instructions on there based on your type of tree. Generally speaking, it's going to be approximately once every seven to 10 or every 14 days, depending upon the time of year and the uh, species of tree. But there is typically a little chart in the label that's gonna tell you what to spray and when. The, um, the other thing that is important to note, especially for uh, blooming fruit trees is you never want to spray even the organic products during the bloom time because basically all fruit trees are going to be bee pollinated. And so we don't want to be spraying insecticides while the tree is in full bloom. So we want to give it a rest while it's in full bloom. And then after the blooms have dropped, after those petals have dropped, then we're going to start, uh, or, or I should say, we're gonna start respraying or we're gonna start spraying again. So that's a little bit about uh, fruit tree care. We won't get super deep into, you know, what each different tree is, you know, what diseases affect them or, or what uh, insects are affecting them because that the fruit tree spray is basically an all-in-one spray that's going to take care of the leaf diseases. It's going to take care of the fruit issue, uh, the uh, fruit insect issues, things like that. So worms in your apples and black spots on your leaves and all of that kind of stuff. It's gonna take care of all of that. So um, that's just a little bit about fruit trees. Let's go look at the small fruit and we'll discuss a little bit about those. So right over here uh, to my left are, uh, is our blueberry selection. And blueberries are a really fun crop to grow for a couple of reasons. The first thing that I wanna point out about uh, or discuss about blueberries is that they're a really ornamental plant. They're actually very attractive. So this is something you don't have to hide it in a garden somewhere or put it in the back of the yard where nobody's gonna see it. They're very, very attractive plants. So these trees are going to get uh, white flowers in the springtime. They typically, the leaves are going to come out kind of a pinky red, or sometimes an orangey red. So the, the new growth is very attractive. And then the fall color is usually really nice, really nice oranges, reds, sometimes some pinks in there. I'll show you over here. This is, uh, this is one blueberry here, which is showing some signs of new growth. Oftentimes the new growth, when these leaves are young and tender, come out kind of a purple color. It's sort of a, a built-in suntan lotion, if you will. So when the leaves are really young and tender, They've got different pigmentation. So green pigmentation is the one that most people are familiar with. That's going to be your chlorophyll. And there are other um, pigmentations that are going to be different colors. So like, you know, oranges are gonna be your carotenoids and different things like that. So we get this nice purple here and this has beautiful fall color. A lot of those same colors are going to be present in the fall. And you can see they're already setting blueberries on here, even in the pot. These already have some nice fruit set going on. So going back to the conversation about self-pollinating versus, uh, versus not self-fruitful or not self-pollinating, blueberries technically are self-pollinating. However, you will always get a larger yield, that means more fruit, and you're going to get more flavorful fruit if you have two different varieties. So even though they don't require cross-pollination, cross-pollination is recommended for them. The same is true of uh, raspberries, um, pretty much most fruit to be honest, but you're definitely going to get a, a better yield and, and nice, nice big fruit, usually bigger fruit. Also, oddly enough, the fruit tends to mature up to a week faster than it does without cross-pollination. So very strange, I don't understand that, but, um, but I, know that, uh, I know it to be true. So 
Very cool plants, again, very attractive. You've got the nice blue fruit on here, beautiful uh, foliage. Some of them have uh, smaller leaves. There's some really unique varieties that are designed to be grown in containers, which works really well. Um, so very cool plants. The uh, blueberries like a more acidic soil. So we do have a soil mix called Dr. Earth Acid Lover Soil Mix. So here in Northern Illinois, we have a very alkaline soil. Our soil pH tends to be in the 7.3 to 7.6 range. Blueberries are gonna like it really under six. So they really like an acidic soil. So what I like to do with blueberries is actually dig up the soil that's in the ground, plant the blueberry with that Dr. Earth Acid Lovers mix, and then periodically, typically twice a year, I like to use a, a product called Soil Acidifier. Um, it's typically a, a, a sulfate type product, and that can be sprinkled on the soil, watered in about twice a year, and that's going to take care of soil pH issues. So blueberries are gonna be pretty sensitive to that. Raspberries, however, are not going to be sensitive to the pH of the soil. So they actually can, can tolerate that alkaline soil just fine. Um, over here, I've got some I've got some currants growing. We've got uh, some grapes on the other side. Um, with grapes, you're going to have to be a little bit more choosy in our area here in Northern Illinois, because many grapes, uh, especially some of the varieties that you might be familiar with, uh, for you know that are going to be like wine type grapes. You know, a lot of your um, you know your Zinfandels and Pinot Grigio. A lot of those grapes are not going to be hardy in our area. But we do have some good grapes that can be grown here. There's actually kind of a growing wine industry in Illinois, um, out near Galena, even just a little west of us, there's a lovely vineyard um, called Aqua Viva. So you can grow wine grapes in Illinois. Uh, they'll do just fine here. It's just there's gonna be specific varieties that are more cold hardy than others. So you might not get the same varieties that you would if you uh, lived in Northern California or Italy or, or wherever. So. Um, so lot, lots to choose from on the grape side of things. Um, on the uh, raspberry side of things, I did want to mention a little bit about uh, raspberry canes and raspberry care. So uh, there's basically, in terms of raspberries, there's two types of, of growth that they can have depending upon the variety of uh, raspberry. So some of them have what are called primo canes and some of them have what are called flora canes. So raspberries that have flora canes are going to be, uh, they typically are going to fruit best on two year old canes, which is the flora cane, that's the two year old. So the first year they're gonna basically grow a cane, that cane can be trimmed back a little bit. And then that second year, it's gonna branch out a bit more to the side and that's where the fruit is going to be produced on that flora cane. Once that fruit is harvested or at the end of that season, those, those canes typically die back and you're going to actually remove that cane at that point. So after the second year, you're gonna cut that cane off and your one-year-old canes are then for the following season will be the flora canes and you're going to get new growth every year. So that's sort of the, the process of maintaining a raspberry patch that has flora canes. So you're going to allow them to grow the first year. The first year canes, you're not gonna get much or any fruit. You're gonna cut those canes typically in half or by about uh, one third. They're gonna to start to branch out. And then on those branching sides is where you're going to see the fruit. On the uh, opposite side, on the primo cane, uh, varieties, those tend to fruit out at the very tip of the cane. It's almost like a first flush and a second flush of growth. So it's almost doing its two year thing in one year. So you get this initial push of growth and then you get the secondary flush. And then on that secondary flush, they're going to develop fruit there. They also tend to be more of your late blooming raspberry. So they're gonna be more of a fall raspberry, like fall gold is one that comes to mind. Fall gold will produce in year one out on the tips of those canes. So that's a primo cane uh, variety. Um, however, you can uh, treat them like a flora cane. And after the first year, you can cut that back and it will also do basically the same thing. So two-year-old canes are gonna get removed all the way uh, after the growing season, after the second year, they're gonna get cut off basically all the way at the ground. And if you've got big long canes that have grown the previous year, typically you're gonna cut those in half. It's a really good idea. Some pruning is better than no pruning on raspberries. If you don't prune raspberries, you're gonna get just a wild, crazy patch out there that's hard to manage, that doesn't fruit very well, 
and uh, is not able to really, you're not able to get in there and harvest it. So I definitely recommend pruning those raspberries uh, to some degree, cutting them in half. If, if that's the only thing you do, that's better than nothing. But getting in there and trimming out all of those dead canes after the second year is really what's going to be recommended on those to keep a good, healthy raspberry patch. Um, in terms of varieties, we've got, there's basically ever bearing raspberries like Heritage and Caroline. And then there's some of those fall blooming varieties. Um, but I wanted to mention a couple of other varieties here. This is one of my favorites, uh, especially if you've got you know, kids or grandkids interested in picking fruit, growing fruit. This is a thornless raspberry that is dwarf in nature, but still has regular sized fruit. So you can actually see all the fruit that's being produced on here. It's got a whole bunch of fruit forming. So full sized uh, berries are forming on a dwarf plant, but there's no thorns in here. I can rub my hands all throughout here no thorns whatsoever, where all of the other raspberries are quite thorny. I've tasted these. We've been growing them for quite a number of years now. The taste is fantastic. It grows really well in a pot since it has that sort of short stature. It's really going to grow well in a pot. So um, where normally raspberries, we'd recommend growing those in, a ground, in the ground. You could definitely get away with growing blueberries in a container with that Dr. Earth acid lover soil mix or some similar acid in nature or acidic in nature mix. Blueberries grow very well in a container. If you're going to do that, I recommend putting them in an unheated garage for the winter, put them towards an interior wall and then water them about once a month. That's a really good way to care for plants that are gonna be in that unheated garage. So they do need a dormant period, but when they're in a pot, that pot can sometimes freeze too hard or too fast. So uh, putting it, keeping it in the pot and then moving it to the unheated garage generally works really well. And then if you wanna do the same thing with these raspberries, you could do that. We, uh, we also have black raspberries, blackberries. All of those are in the Rubus family. So all of those uh, raspberry, blackberry, black raspberry, all of those are gonna be in the same family and more or less require the same type of care and the same type of growing conditions, which is typically full sun, although they do quite well in partial sun. Um, some of the like wild blackberries can even grow well in partial shade or mostly shade. So they're pretty shade tolerant. Blueberries are also relatively shade tolerant. Um, full sun is recommended, but part shade, uh, part sun, either of those are gonna be fine. If it's really dense shade, they're probably not going to do so well. Um, on the blueberries, as I was mentioning, some of that really unique uh, leaf color. You can see some of these other varieties over here. This is uh, one of the, I think, the more attractive varieties. This is called peach sorbet, and it gets this really nice peachy color to the foliage. There's some other leaves back here that have that nice burgundy tinge and a little bit of the peachy foliage up on the top here. In the spring, the whole plant comes out that color. So it's got a really attractive uh, foliage look to it. And then normal fruit, edible, nice size, all that kind of stuff. And there's also some, some small leafed varieties that are kind of cool. This one's called Berry Bucks. I, I think the name, I think what they're doing is trying to, it's a playoff of words. Uh, Buxus is, a, is the botanical name for, um, uh, for boxwood. And if you look at it, it really has a very a leaf that is very reminiscent of boxwood. So they've called this variety berry bucks. This is definitely a great variety for a container. It's a smaller variety, but um, you know, really nice dark green glossy leaves, great foliage and fall color and all that kind of stuff. So again, really attractive. But uh, you know, even though some of these varieties are still young and in a pot, I mean, you can see how much fruit these are already producing. On, on just a small young plant, a potted plant here. So this variety is called pink icing. So wonderful, uh, wonderful fruit set on these. Uh, generally speaking, it's gonna take two to three years for most of these plants to really uh, mature enough to the point where you're getting really good harvestable fruit. But absolutely, I mean, you can pick fruit off of these in year one you know, feel free to eat some of that. Are you gonna get enough to make a pie or, or jam or whatever in the first year? Probably not, um, but you're gonna get some fruit and it's a lot of fun to do with the kids. Um, we also do strawberries. Got some strawberries over here. 
Strawberries are a perennial ground cover and they there's ever bearing and June bearing strawberries. Ever bearing, as the name suggests, kind of fruit throughout the season. Uh, so not really forever, but throughout the season. Whereas the June bearing varieties just produce one large crop in June. So a lot of people who like to can, make jams, jellies, things like that, they go for the June bearing because they can get all of that all at once and then make their, you know, do their canning or whatever they're going to do. Whereas the ever bearing varieties that are gonna be all throughout the summer are great for that, you know, kind of more random picking or just to be able to pick periodically and put onto the table in a bowl or, or whatever. Um, it's a really good idea when you're planting uh, uh, strawberries to put these in the ground and put some straw around them to keep the weeds down at first. So you're really gonna wanna make sure that you do a really good job of cleaning the bed out prior to doing any planting. That way you're gonna avoid as much as possible, um, you know, weeds are kind of an inevitability, but we wanna avoid weed growth as much as possible. So what I like to do is clean that bed out really, really good, plant the strawberries and put some straw in between the rows and in between the plants to act basically as a mulch. You don't want to bark mulch or anything real heavy, but the straw does a good job of cooling the soil, keeping moisture in the soil and keeping the weeds down a little bit. Um, and then you're going to want to, especially for the first season or two, while the patch is establishing itself, you're going to want to make sure you get in there and pull out any grasses or weeds that happen to grow in there. But otherwise being a perennial plant as the raspberries and blueberries and all of that are uh, as well, you're gonna have fruit basically, you know, forever, as long as you can care for the plants and as long as they're uh, alive and healthy. And, you know, pruning and spraying are definitely a part of that. So um, there's a lot of other options. We've got the fall gold raspberry that I was mentioning earlier over here. Um, as I mentioned, we have currant and gooseberry, uh, josta berry. Uh, we have, I think we still have some hops. We've, we've got hops vines, we have rhubarb, so there's a lot of great fruit that we can grow here in Northern Illinois, and we can help you with that. If you have questions about what varieties to plant or how to care for them, we'd be happy to try to you know, help you out with that. Additionally, right now for the next week, we have a uh, Father's Day special going on with all of our fruit. So um, I believe it is until June 23rd that our uh, fruit trees and small fruit, so all of the raspberries, blueberries, uh, strawberries, et cetera, as well as all the fruit trees, the apples, the peaches, the pears, the plums, all of that stuff is 25% off the marked price. So get, good way to get your uh, home orchard started, give you a little help there and uh, maybe a great gift idea for dad. So. I hope you have a wonderful Father's Day weekend. I hope the weather is good wherever you're at, and I hope you get a chance to get outside. Thanks for watching.